All right, guys, welcome to yet another boss battle. Brian, aka Boss and Roll, is ready to do it all again. And today we're going to be preparing for Vintage and Eternal Weekend. And Brian wanted to showcase the point of view of Oath. And I decided that it was cool for me to play the basically the field, the gauntlet, whatever you want to call it. And the first deck we have is Demir Allurus. So this deck is a control deck trying to win the game with a Psychic Frog or a Lurus or chip damage from Bowmasters, all the while keeping your opponent at bay with removal spells and counter spells and wastelands, I guess. Um, that is kind of a problem because Brian's deck doesn't care about removal spells. Brian's deck is actually happy if I'm playing out some creatures, and Brian's deck will probably be having a show and tell package that I can't really punish. So I think this matchup is going to be very, very hard. Whether my pierces and forces can bury um, Brian before his plan gets online, attracts I can't deal with. Um, so yeah, it's going to be up to my counters to do the heavy lifting. Even sideboard wise, I don't have much. Um, I have I'll board in a couple of consigns, mind break trap, a two mana draw a card, soul guide lantern, maybe the steel sabotage to get rid of the removal spells. And then I'm going to hope for the best uh, two out of three games, which is, yeah, oof, that's going to be incredibly tough. Um, but uh, yeah, the night is young, and uh, let's see how it goes. All right, guys, quick message here. If you want to have access to my deck guides, my strategy articles, whether you want to pitch me a sweet deck to play on the channel, um, whether you want to look into coaching or simply just want to say thank you for the content I put out, please check out my Patreon below and become a Baron today. Now. Let's get back to the games. All right, guys, here we are. Match one. I'm playing Lurus against Oath, and I won the die roll. We will alternate for the remainder of the matches, but for match one, the die roll actually matters. Being on the play here is quite cool. I have a Force Wheel and I have a Frog, so I will probably play this slow with Polluted Delta for Surveil Land. And then I hope to use this Time Walk to get in an extra hit with the Frog and use the Probus Force Fodder. Having three lands is, you know, not ideal. One of them could have been a wasteland. This could have been a spell, whatever. But I'm not going to complain here. I definitely have decent working conditions. As I talked about in the deck tech, not much aside from my counter spells matter. My opponent gets to do their thing. Probably not winning. Um, yeah, let's see if the game goes so long that, that Luris will get in the mix. Slow rolling the probe here, I feel like is a is a decent tool to have up in your arsenal. Um, if I cycle it here and I don't, you know, I don't hit anything blue, then I can be in trouble. Oh, huh. okay. My opponent wants to go turn one Oko, which unfortunately I cannot allow. Can't really beat that card. That's actually a problem. So my opponent most likely has back-to-back -back Haymaker, and that's kind of how they beat me. There's a Black Lotus, so that Black Lotus lets me go Brock Time Walk, so I should probably take it. Brock Time Walk. Yeah, I mean, let's do it. What can I? What else can I do? Yeah, I think I have to play like this. Because I, I could time walk into, you know, a Lurus, but I think this is just going to be better in every conceivable way. So here, let's go uh, Psychic Frog. Then let's go Time Walk. And then I'm trying to draw something like Spell Pierce, Force Negation, Ancestral, that kind of jazz. Not trying to draw a Vexing Bobble. Psychic Frog getting in there. What can we draw? I draw Wasteland, which is not a good card. Uh, right now, that is. Um, so let's see. I can play Bobble and Crack It, which I think would be helpful. Probably do it out of a Swamp. Maybe I shouldn't have... Yeah, the in, I think I have to play like this. Hold up the mana. 
All right, so now I'm at the mercy of, you know, Brian having a bad hand. To be honest, Brian will, Brian will keep Mox Mox land uh, Oko no matter what. So that's kind of what I'm, what I'm hoping here. Tinker, alrighty. Yeah, this is a big problem. When you can bait with Oko and then follow up with the Tinker, then then you kind of play the, um. Then you kind of play the the coveted jewel type of magic, and uh, yeah, not much, not much to do about that. So, as I talked about, the removal spells are incredibly bad against Oath. Um, the consigns, you know, can counter and attra attracts a trigger. It's not, it's not amazing, but it's not nothing either. So those cards are acceptable. I don't think the bauble is playable in any way. I think the Soul Guide is like the most minor upgrade you can imagine, but it is still an upgrade because if I have to leave it in play, it does not disrupt my ability to force. Okay, I mean, <laughs> let's let's run it back and hope to uh and hope to have a bit more fortune. But I think that 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 game is not, you know, that game is not a crazy representation of what's going on. Oath is very complicated to beat if they if they can go back to back bomb. Let's see, what will Brian upgrade with here? Maybe just a little bit of disruption, like maybe he plays Veil, maybe he plays like a Fluster, something along those lines. But yeah, this is. Oath is a great solution. If you if you if you expect to play against a lot of Luris at the top tables, Oath is an awesome deck. Um no doubt, no doubt about it. And 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 yeah, Brian has been playing this deck for I don't know, like maybe even maybe even years. Um and he's been doing incredibly well with it. I'm 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 pretty excited to pick his brain about why that is. Um well, both why he played it and why he, he did so well with it. Because I feel like there's a lot of it's a lot of it's a, it's like a meta game deck. Let's say everybody was playing the One Ring, then it was not a you know a great choice. So I think it's because of mainly because of Luris being kind of kind of lending itself to be just being weak to it by its core, and then tri historically it's been you know um, Workshop that's been uh, that's been weak to it. Uh, my. Not want to do that. Sorry about that. All right, back here after a weird cut. Sorry about that. I'll play first. I'll choose my cat. And I will have a hand that can go turn one Psychic Frog with no disruption. I can also cycle a Soul Guide Lantern in the meantime, which is kind of funny. There is not a way for me to go um, uh, not not having to exile my own Lotus, because if I do Soul Guide first, I don't have the mirror mana to play the Lotus. Hmm. So if I keep this hand, I'm saying, I don't think Brian can do anything broken turn one, and I trust the top two cuts of my deck to be in our action for turn two. I think that's simply not good enough, which is very, very sad. Okay, this is funny. The, the good old turn one twister. I guess we, we go for that. Um, keep this hand and bottom treasure cruise, I believe. So that is basically only relevant if Brian manages to win the war over, over the turn one twister, which is kind of funny. Kind of cool. I can get, keep a card in the bank here, thanks to the bauble. Uh, let's yeah, let's time twister. So let's bell pierce the force of will and hope for the best. So now I have a mana tap, which is not ideal, and this hand is very bad. Okay, well, I hope Brian's hand is also bad. I see a show-and-tell on top of the deck. I'm looking to draw two cards right away because my hand is terrible. 
Yeah, this is like what I was about to say. You can't you can't mulligan these twister hands, unfortunately. So uh Okay, well those those are two good magic cards. Not gonna complain about those. That was that was amazing. So let's see. What is Brian up to? Brian is up to casting Oath of Druids, and we, we simply cannot let that happen. That that card is unbeatable in play. Um because let me think here. I need to set up like the biggest time walk you can ever imagine. Hmm. And then with the twister gone, I need to put a lot of creatures into play and then and then time walk. Like this is unthinkable. Before Brian finds Forbidden Orchard, that's kind of the that's kind of the deal as well. So Brian is done playing lands here. This game will be so weird. I need to do 17 damage in one swoop with with the help of a time walk that I don't have and via creatures I don't have either. I guess I can set up something about with um, consign some memory as well to time walk through um, the oath trigger. Their psychic frog, which I mean, this doesn't do anything yet. So let's see if Brian can do anything cool here. I'm scared this is a vampiric tutor that straight up ends the game. Oh, this is a flash. Okay, that'll that'll do it. Let's just see what what Brian has kicking up here. I didn't feel like I could, you know, afford to play around. A lot of stuff here. So let's see. There's Forbidden Orchard. That is GG's. All right. Too easy for Brian here. Getting no chance at all. Let's see if I can uh, come back stronger. All right. Second deck coming up is Dredge. Using the power of Bazaar of Baghdad to plow through the deck with Dredge cards like Golgari Grave Troll, which is just restricted. Stingweed Imp Golgari Thug, hopefully hitting some Nark Amoebas, some Icarid, some Creeping Chills along the way. Hopefully I can cast turn one hollow one. Hopefully I have a counterspell of the negation or will variety and a little bit of grief here and throwing in for good measure. Um, so yeah, disrupt your opponent. Put up a fast clock and hope for the best. Sideboard-wise, I have Force of Vigorous. That's going to be good against Brian. And uh, maybe the Wastelands, but let's see about that. I think this matchup is going to be quite opening hand dependent. Um, we will be playing with, yeah, known matchups. So in that way, you know, Brian can kind of account for it. Whereas if you play in an open field tournament, Dredge is better because of the unknown factor and just a lot of magic cards not being very e efficient against a, a deck like Dredge. But we'll have to take that with a grain of salt today. And hopefully I can showcase the power of Dredge. All right, match two of our Oath versus the World situation here. I have to mulligan. I have no Bizarre Baghdads because I'm playing Dredge. I have to mulligan. I will powder and keep. I don't know if I keep. Am I ever shuffling the deck? I think that's what I have to ask myself. I'll try and put those boys back. Done. Powder once more. Mulligan. And we found a hand. That is amazing. Mulligan to four. Um, so... Mm, huh. I can put back Bazaar, Meba. Or maybe I have to post to... Huh. Yeah, I'll try and keep a negation here. So I get rid of these cards. I think that's reasonable. I will say that... I don't even... I'm not... Yeah, okay, I can't activate Bizarre Turn 1. I was just about to say, maybe I can't even activate Bizarre Turn 1, but... Actually can so I have one one force so I'm losing to back to back bombs like we we saw in the previous match and I'm losing to bomb plus you know force of will 
And that's problematic. So in this matchup, I don't care as much about Oko, but I care about Show and Tell Attracts, and I care about Oath of Druids. Brian, of course, will take into account the matchup. Brian, uh, we we play with you know he'll he'll know the matchup, but if he didn't, he would he would learn from Serum Powder. So pretty interesting. Okay, Forbidden Orchard pass. You draw an Archimeba, which is a just a blank card. This is funny. Uh, so I guess I discard those. That's funny. Into all the forces. Unfortunately, this is not a seven card hand. If this was a seven card hand, I could actually use those forces. But ooh, strip mine is a great one here. Strip mine is the odd card in Oath where it can just randomly save the day. Okay, I do hit another bad dredger. So now you know. I look silly for not keeping the double bazaars, but I guess that's just how it goes sometimes. So now it's time for Brian to start playing some magic. It is indeed an Oath of Druids that I will counter. Brian knows that I, I, I can't have another counter magic here. It's impossible. So now I can bring back a um, Icarid. I can dredge three, heal three, attack for four, and then I lose to the Atraxa. So pretty, pretty smooth sailing for Brian so far. I hope to put up a better challenge. Here's Atraxa, trying to learn a little bit about the deck. Atraxa hitting... Crip, Tinker, Vamp. But yeah, this is gonna be this is gonna be just fine. I guess how many chills do I have before I concede? One chill, two chill, three chills gone. Yeah, that's totally fine. Okay. No no chance so far. Um I like the vigors. And it's unclear if the chill package is Great. So in that case, I would remove those six and bring in a couple of wastelands for good measure. I think I like that. Keep in hollow one because it's just, you know, zero mana four four. Question is, what is more damage? Creeping chills I can dig into or hollow ones that I need in my opener. I don't know. <laughs> It's really anybody's guess at that point. Um, strip mine and wasteland are playable if Brian has to go, you know, land pass with turn two oath. They're good against the odd tabernacle that I'm not really sure I can play around, but maybe I can. I like all the griefs because I'm on the play. Yeah, let's try and let's try and run it. Let's try and run it. Brian is really coming in with a vengeance here after the two other uh, episodes we did. And uh, whew, this could be his night to, uh, to totally crush me. I have high hopes for the, the jewel matchup, though. That should be cool. But I can also win this one, so... Uh, it's 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 so tough because I need my my vigors negations forces reefs. I feel like I kind of need two of those, like bizarre double disruption. Then I feel like I'm crushing. But when I only have one, or things get super awkward with the mulligans of four and drawing into a million forces without you know putting a lot of dredgers in the yard, which in case makes me way less explosive. Oof. Then, then this deck is not anything special. Let me put it that way. So, also, I don't know if Brian's on ley lines. I don't know if Brian's on traps. I don't know if Brian's on format crypt. I don't know if Brian's on naked plan. Lean on emissary. 
Um, that's kind of the the tricky part. For Brian, it's relatively simple that I'm leaning on forces of you know blue and green colors to uh, to disrupt. A little bit of a mulligan, a little bit of a keep. So now I feel like I have to get rid of Wasteland, which is reasonable. So let's see, get rid of Wasteland. No ley line. Okay, that's cool. Um, hmm. Should I grief first or should I bizarre first? I feel like I should bizarre first. Is that even true? Hmm. Let's try and imagine a scenario where Brian... The thing is, I'm pitching grief to grief. I don't have any bridges or anything, so I think I might as well look at the hand instead of getting, you know, surgical for no reason or something. So let's try this. Let's try and grief. It's been a while since I've played that card. Okay, nice hand, nice hand. So, hmm, what do I think about this? The show and tell plus emissary is a combo. The Emissary is a dead card on its own. Brian has... Hmm. I, kinda, I want Brian to cast Tinker this game. And then the question is, if Brian is playing Sphinx, probably is. That Tabernacle is super nasty. Um... How do I get Brian to cast the card Tinker? It's probably by taking the show and tell. Let's try taking the show and tell. Then I will activate Czar, discard Triple Dredger. The problem with this play is the jig is kind of up when I start slow dredging. And by slow dredging, I mean I'm not, you know, spamming this, this in my upkeep. But I guess it's fine. Let's see. C and Pearl played out. So I think if I return, th yeah, I can't. I guess I kind of mask my play by returning a uh, Golgari Thug here. Icarus is exactly how I want to beat the Tabernacle. Hmm. Can I do anything smart by activating Bazaar now, or is it better to you know not let Brian know how much trouble he's in? I think that's better. Also, right now, I look like somebody with a Force of Vigor, which, you know, could be good for me. One acre in the yard, so now I can kind of commence the beatdown. Sarah's Emissary. Pretty cool plan. Like, if this enters and Brian chooses Creature, then I ju I, I'm just losing. So here, the, the Tinker is not an ass punishing for Brian because it doesn't leave him in the dirt. But I guess it's kind of the same as drawing a land, even better for me, I guess. So here, I'll forcible the Tinker. There comes Tabernacle, which is why I'm not going to bother activating on main face, which normally would be the good play when you hit, when you hit Amalgams. So... Oh well, yeah, or an Archimiba, I guess. So yeah, draw two, discard three. I'm not gonna bother putting that into play because I can't really do much with Tabernacle. One Icarid. It's kind of sad. Let's go for the activation here. I guess we get a flyer here for good measure and a bunch of guys. Exile the grief. Draw, dredge six more. Let's count the Icarids after all of this. I think I got... I didn't exactly get lucky here, but I did hit a second one, which is... You know, a playable magic card, so... I can't beat Brian next turn, but I'm trying... For the turn after that, let's see. Tinker gone, Knackle gone. 
Hopefully Brian just passes the turn here. That's kind of what my success is depending on, I feel like. Because remember, all of these creatures in play, they're going to they're gonna hit the bin because of Tabernacle. Oh, shoot. Okay. Okay, so now Oko hits the fields. And here's a 3-3. Three, three. So now I'm not going to pay for any of these. I am going to bring back a couple of Icarids, though. Do I have any bad creatures? No griefs. So I guess I go for sh that card and another. So these are dead. Twenty-one cards in the deck, no chills, which is, you know, a bit of a problem here. Let's see. So now I'm down to eleven cards, discarding those. I hit the two remaining Icarids, which is kind of cool. So now it doesn't really matter too much what I do here, I feel like. I don't want to deck myself out, and I already have enough black creatures, and so I guess it doesn't really matter. I'm going to click no to this one. So what happens if I double attack Oko? Is that useful? Probably. Let's double attack Oko. Pass. Here's a food. Here comes Quad Icarid, so let's remove these amalgams. Let's, I guess, draw a card. Grief doesn't do anything. Well, okay, okay, I see you. Could actually be valuable, so let's make sure I kill my opponent next turn. Uh, if I attack my opponent for 12 here, can the Oko do anything meaningful? I attack for 12, 5. My opponent gains 3, goes up to 8. The next turn, it's either a blocker or... Okay, so I'm actually going to attack Bosch. I think this is exactly lethal through um, a couple of foods getting sacked. Then I'm going to grief away at least the Emissary so Bosch cannot draw um, show and tell. I don't think... I don't. This is not useless. So Emissary and Flusterstorm. Definitely going to take the Emissary. And then Brian needs a good card right now, or we're going to be seeing four Icarids come back. I'm sad to see Brian uh, <laughs> playing on here. That's not a good sign, I feel like. Thug. Imp. Thug. Imp. So what did he, Brian draw here? Hmm. Maybe the... Oh, wow. Nice draw. Maybe Brian drew the bounce spell. Can't remember the name. Something about gifting a fish. <laughs> That's incredible. Uh, Mint of the Flood Maw. Gift a tap fish. Return target creature under Poland controls. Yeah, I mean, that works. So that is returned. Gain life. And then hopefully, while Brian is tapped out here, the Noxus Revival will prompt the concession. So let's give Brian a nice mana crypt on top of the deck. And we can pass. Hopefully we're we're forcing game three here. Okay.
Luster Storm and Mana Crypt, right? That's so funny. <laughs> Into the Flood Maw. I guess this is kind of an improved Chain of Vapor, which is not bad. So with the way that game played out, I would have absolutely loved Creek, Creek for Creeping Chill to be in my deck. Um, I will say Grief loses some power on the draw, but so does Wasteland. So in theory, I have, I think I want to keep, like, I have these three that I could realistically do something with. Uh, hmm, do I want the chills? I feel like the answer to that question is yes. What is Misstep good against? Trying to think about that deck. Maybe it's just, you know, a blue card. And it's not that bad because of it. But I could go for four chills. Creeping Chill is a decent card. Like, then I have Creeping Chills and Icarid to fight, um, to fight the Tabernacle Angle. Trimming a Grief because I'm on the draw. Still hoping for the same, you know, force situation. Also, unclear if I'm playing against Ley Lines. I actually don't know. Um, which is an advantage for, for the opposing deck. This is definitely kind of... It's a disadvantage of playing Dredge, but you also have the advantage of, you know, in an open field, your opponent keeps, like, a normal hand. Low, uh, oh, look at me, I have a Fatal Push and a Spell Pierce, and then some lands I'll keep. And then you just get dredged out of the yard, so... Definitely some some pros and cons to this kind of strategy, and it, it it's just it's definitely not an advantage in a in a you know open decklist environment. This hand is pretty damn awesome. Like double interaction and a hollow one. I will say no dredger. This could get a bit awkward if the opponent. Um, yes, exactly. If your opponent, the opponent has a slow hand, because then I, I'm not really playing anything out, and I might have to discard relevant cards. Um, but it actually looks like it's going to be fine here. Let's see. Drawing off the bazaar. I, I find a dredger, which is awesome. So I get rid of that. I get rid of that. And I get rid of a negation. Maybe. Ah, oh, maybe I just get rid of a vigor. Having double, double actual force is pretty huge when it comes to fighting the show and tell. I actually like that. So, playing Hollow One here for pressure. My opponent is very often going to let this resolve and then use the counter magic um, to, you know, try and resolve their bomb. So, let's see what this is. Could be Vampiric. It's not Vampiric Tutor. It's a good old thinning of the deck. I think I, I like that. So, I have to think about this Noxious Revival. I want to, you know, use it as a as a time walk later. Huh, wonder what... Here's Oath of Druids, so I'm gonna counter that card, and I'm gonna force my opponent's force if, if I have to. Um, okay, so I guess now I'm activating, and I can't really use the Noxious as that time walk. I don't think that makes sense compared to dredging harder. Um, so that's the logic I'm gonna use here. Uh, did not hit a dredger. One, two, three. I am getting in for some, you know, chip damage. Meba drain with the chill. And I'm, you know, dredging further. Hitting another Meba. Zero Icarids and zero Amalgams, which is probably underperforming here. There's definitely a world where I hit, you know, a couple of Icarids or one Icarid, one Amalgam, and then I have my opponent dead next turn. But now we actually get to play on, which is not ideal. That card resolves. One, two, three, show and tell. I know what that means, so I have to fight over that at all cost. Land. So, obviously, my opponent, one of my opponent's cards is Atraxa or... Um, Emissary, and I really have no clue about the rest. So I guess let's activate Bizarre, Dredge 4, Dredge 3, and here are the cards I needed before to ice the game. 
But unfortunately, my opponent has one more stab at it. And I think I've hit zero Icarids, so even a... Um, what's it called? Tabernacle will do it. But I guess if I just hit a chill here, I'm just the best. I don't... Still no Icarid. Okay, so... I don't know if... Did I hit two or three chills? Just two. Okay. Um... So the cool thing about Show and Tell Emissary is it's not actually winning the game now because I have the chills to dig for. My opponent's at two life. Oath is too late. Okay. Here's Flash Atraxa. And my opponent needs to hit some bangers. Let's see if they can do it. Oath, Time Walk. So I guess the Time Walk is good. The Demonic Tutor, maybe... Time walk. That's, it gets a bit iffy here because Ravenous Trap doesn't... You cannot take Ravenous Trap and Ancestral at the same time. Um, Tinker get... You can't time walk into Tinker. You can't time walk into Demonic Tutor because those are both sorceries. I'm pretty excited to see what, what Bosch comes up with here. Um... Ooh, okay, so taking Demonic Tutor to clear the board with Tabernacle, that works. And then you have Ravenous Trap to handle the yard. Since I haven't hit an Icarid in my top 33, there's actually... There's actually stuff to do here. That's cool. I feel like I'm losing this game that I shouldn't have lost, but that's just, you know, the name of the game. I hit four in Archimibus, zero Icarids, and that's the reason, like, it, that's just like the random numbers generator. It could have been, you know, the other way around, and I was the king of the world, and he, Brian was dead two turns ago. But that's just, you know, part of this deck, that you'll, you'll do something on average, where you have incredibly high highs, and... You, so, I mean, what are you going to do? I, I was unlucky at dredging, like, that's not... You just have to, you know, evaluate the deck and what, what kind of output you're working with um, on average and whether that's good enough, right? But it's, it's interesting how, how much the individual cards actually matter. One chill or one Icarid in the top 33, that's the difference between winning and losing, maybe. I'm pretty excited to see what, what Brian goes for here. I think the, the Demonic Tutor Tabernacle line with the trap in hand, that is going to buy a lot of time because I kind of have to play into it, right? So then I kind of have to hope to hit an Icarid to force the issue and then win with Chill the following turn. Wow, this is, inc this is incredible. Let's see. Atraxa. Let's just note these cards down. Atraxa. Tinker. Trap. No, 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 no. I need to... The one Brian actually chose. Atraxa. Ah, too many triggers. I want to note those cards down. Atraxa. Uh, Beseju. Oath. Scooter, which is gone, and trap. Okay. Well, here we go. So, I guess without Wasteland in the deck, this doesn't matter. The order. So, let's say I had Wasteland in my deck. I should have tried to force the issue on the trap before paying for these guys. So, now... My plan is to dredge from just the draw step into what is hopefully... Wow, not even a Stinkweed Imp. That's amazing. So hopefully a chill. I did not, but I did hit Igorits. Um So now my opponent has to fire off the trap. And then I can respond to that, I guess. Huh. Is that a good play? Let's see. Yeah, I think I'll, I think I'll respond to that if 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 given the chance. 
Okay, no. No trap fired off. But I have double Icarid in the yard. So I wonder if my opponent's plan is to besage you in my bazaar. Probably. Besage you in my bazaar. Then... Hard cast trap if they have the mana. But they need two... They need... Yeah, they need two more mana to do that. This game is very complicated for Oath versus uh, Dredge. <laughs> It's kind of, we both want to be last to act here. Okay, here's a land. My opponent needs one more mana. In order to go besage in my bazaar. Sure, that happens. And then trap my graveyard for four mana. Hmm. Because I'm not going to activate this bazaar. I'm going to be last to act on that one. You like Bran has to get rid of my yard here. And then... Yeah, I mean... Double Icarid trigger on the stack. Here comes the hardcast trap. And this is where I feel like I should dig for... One of the two remaining chills. Because if I don't do it now, I'll have to put another dredger in the yard that will leave more time for Brian. So dredging eight, that's a, a, that's a bit more than a third of my deck. And I have two copies left. Is that better than passing the turn? Brian's hand is Beseju, Oath, Atraxa, two unknowns, which I doubt are... Awesome cards, but I mean, who knows? Trying to think about my alternative here. If I let this happen, Graveyard is gone. Then I can activate Bizarre afterwards. Get Stingweed in the Graveyard. So that's... Uh, this is so complicated. I'm going to activate this bizarre, but I, I couldn't tell you that it's the, the perfect line. I feel like it's so close. So let's dredge Stingweed. And no such luck on... On the chill, so we play on here. And I feel like now I'm losing, right? Because now I'm losing my bizarre to besage you. Ah, this game was awesome. Great game. Great game. Let's search and look at the two chills. Oh, you guys, you guys were so close. So now my opponent can play, I guess, out Oath if they want to, but... So now I have to get up to... Natural hand size? I didn't even check how many bizarres are left. It looks like I have one bizarre left, so we're actually not just wasting our time. That's kind of cool. Ah, <laughs> oh, Magic the Gathering is a beautiful game, right? That is a bizarre Baghdad. <laughs> oh, crap. So, I guess... This is so stupid. So... Draw two. Which two cards can I draw? I guess I do it now. Maybe on the opponent's upkeep because of... Um, Ravenous Trap getting drawn. No, then I have to do it now, yeah. So I've, now I put Icarid into the yard, I put Dredger and Dredger, and I actually keep, you know, Vigor green card. I'm threatening lethal with Icarid once more. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, 
Uh, Atraxa, Oath. Are the cards I know about. Atraxa and Oath. This is so funny. Is this hardcast Atraxa? <laughs> That's incredible. Because now... Did I misplay? I should have counted that Brian was one man off here, in my opinion. So these these are not um, these are not ravenous traps. <laughs> oh, this game is so this game is really really absurd. Brian is down to one. My spirit's gonna die. Yeah, I, I'm really not happy with how I played this because I could count Brian had six man and play, so one orchard from or pearl from you know. Um, hardcasting Atraxa. Oath is too late because I'm getting to both Icarid and um, chill on my next turn, so I mean, let's just fire this off. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Kill a couple of mocks in here. Doesn't really do anything. So Brian would have had to find Trap in the meantime. That's basically all I can hope for. And here's Double Chill, so I guess we now learn. Yep. Wow, what a match. I even dredged down to zero here. <laughs> that was so bad. But I guess the game was over if Brian could handle this. But that's so funny, I just clicked the, the thug. Oof. Okay, dredge got the job done here, but... <laughs> Oh my god, what a game. I'm very excited to go and watch this back. I don't think I played this perfectly, but yeah, let's see. Let's see. All right, one and one. See you in the next match. All right, next deck, third in line here is Jewel Shops. Um, workshop, cast a jewel, hopefully draw your deck. Paradoxical Outcome does kind of the same thing. The One Ring is good redundancy. You have a Force of Will plan, which is... Quite unique for these blazing fast combo decks. I will say we're very weak to artifact hate. Um, it's unclear how much Brian can play realistically in his oath deck. I would assume I'm playing against a couple of Besejus, a couple of Vigors, and that's more or less it. Um, sometimes, you know, Trinisphere and Vexing Bauble can keep your opponent from playing Force of Will, then we can kind of go off. I expect light sideboarding with a couple of negations coming in, and I will think about... Um, the defense grids, I'll even think about the lodestone golem on the play, but let's cross that bridge when we get there. Jewel Shops puts a lot of pressure on the opponent's starting hand. Um, I will say also that the One Ring um, synergizes, or interacts rather, very well, for me at least, against Oath of Druids, because the Oath of Druids needs to target an opponent, and if I just had uh, cast a ring, Brian cannot target me with the One Ring, so... I'm hoping that interaction comes up, and in general, I'm pretty confident about this matchup. I think it's going to be cool. Maybe we even get to see Fraction Metamorph, Copy, and Atraxa, but more realistically, we don't. Um, this deck has recently been hit by a couple of restrictions, Saga and Bobble, but I don't think it hurts this deck too much. Uh, I will say it also hurts other decks, so that's kind of fine in this new environment. Um, that's also what Brian is, is trying to take advantage of, the fact that Oath wasn't hit at all, but all, all other decks have gotten worse. All right, that's going to do it for the deck tech. Let's get to the games. All right, match three of the Vintage Gauntlet. I'm playing Jewel Shops, and my, my hand is weird. I can go turn one, Pearl, Workshop, Metamorph the Pearl to bridge into you know, turn to Coveted Jewel, which is, you know, it's good enough, but it's not amazing when you have to use your Phyrexian Metamorph as a Darksteel Ingot <laughs> or, you know, nerfed Coalition Relic. Let's see what Brian thinks of his seven here. Um, Jewel is a deck that can really put the, the opposing, opposing deck under pressure. I wouldn't fault Brian for mulliganing into a Force of Will, or at least, you know, die trying. Sometimes the game is just over with this deck. But yeah, not exactly the case here. It's like I have to um, 
yeah, bridge in this weird way, uh, but let's see if that works out. Metamorph the pearl. And then I can go, might as well develop the manifold key here. That is a card that will help me later, hopefully, uh, because my backup is Paradoxical Outcome. So also worth noting is, if Brian is trying to be the, the aggressor here, Demonic Tutor, definitely a good card here. So if Brian didn't already have the Force, I imagine that's the case now. And if that hand has to force, it's down to three cards, can't, can't cast any payoff with the mana in play. So at that point, it just becomes kind of, you know, unthinkable that, oh, well, I mean, random land and a tinker, I guess. But let's see. Let's see. Black Lotus. Oh, wow. So Brian might be trying to. Oh, crap. Okay. I guess we are uh, officially. Officially doing it here. I'm drawing three. And uh, Brian is getting an Atraxa trigger. So draw. I draw into Force of Will, which is interesting. So what I could do here is draw four before Brian gets to resolve the Atraxa trigger. How does that sound? How does that sound? Uh, so sh like this. Untap. This is kind of weird. Weird dynamic. So I'm doing like this because, like, you know, could find something like Ancestral Recall or whatever. So one, two, three, four, going down to two mana floating. That's unfortunately not enough for a Sink into Stupor. Force your Force. So Brian is now down to zero cards. And as I talked about in the deck tech, I can potentially, you know, clone the attracts the next turn. I draw into Counter Backup, which is... Quite nice. Have a couple of zeros and a monolith. We really get some action here today. I love it. So what do we flip over here? We can keep... Looks like we can keep a single piece of interaction with the negation. We would have to take Tinker or Atraxa to... Um, have something to pitch. But I have that covered with my own... Force of Will. So I like my chances here. Let's see, attracts in this deck. We'll lose the mana, sure. So let's see. Attracts a, a Tinker Oath Drop, which will hit the battlefield, I'm sure. Mox Force of Negation. Okay. Oh, right, this was turn one. Oh, my God. No land drop to go. This was turn one. Stupid me. I thought <laughs> I thought we were in the mid-game already. Okay, so my opponent has one counter. I guess we're playing these out no matter what. Not being a Traxa. Is that good in this deck? I have a lot of artifacts. I have a lot of lands. And then I have some... So, basically, I'm asking, is it better to... Do that or just draw with Jewel. It's very possible it's just better to draw with Coveted Jewel. But I guess we can also kind of delay that decision. So let's play like this. Paradoxical Outcome is also drawing a ton of cards now. Uh, so let's see. Three. Let's do it like this. Untap. Five, six, coveted jewel. I will get forced. And then what do I even pitch here? I feel like I'm pitching. Atraxa. Tinker is a good one for next turn. What are the odds that I play coveted jewel with the intention to actually get countered? Is that insane? Is that insane? That is the question. So Pearl is gone. Negation is gone. Atraxa is gone. Uh, so my opponent's hand is now... 
Inker Trop Oath. Maybe this is fine, and I just counter the Tinker. <laughs> uh, so Ancient Tomb Atraxa sounds like a juicy play here. Magic the Gathering. What a game. What a game. Instant. Artifact. The One Ring. Is that juicy here? Kind of juicy. I have Minimo. No blue aside from Jewel, though. So the, the outcome is for sure. Am I taking another? I guess I'm taking another Jewel. That is, let's see. Uh, maybe that's too much. Maybe it's better to just. I guess I'm pitching one of the outcomes. So taking Grim Monolith, maybe. Good play, who knows? Is Grim Monolith even better than a zero? In that case, I don't think it is, so might as well take Mana Crypt. So let's do that. Pass the turn. So funnily enough, I am now not interested in blocking. Because that attracts and play is incredible with paradoxical, paradoxical outcome. Kind of unconventional here to let my opponent uh, counter the jewel. Counter the tinker, pretty backbreaking here for Brian. He knows, well, he doesn't know, but another outcome is coming here. Oath and one unknown in hand. It's obviously not a fluster with the way Brian played. I feel like I should take the damage here, go down to five, and then I should uh, draw my deck and be on my way. Black Lotus. Nice draw. So I guess I just play my stuff here. Play that, play that. Covet a jewel. Nice cards, nice cards, so let's go untap the jewel. Let's play this card. So I guess now things become a bit boring, but that's just how this deck works sometimes. Um, so let's... Fire off outcome one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten cards. And now we set up infinite turns and we actually get to finish the game in a reasonable time frame. Um, yeah, we can sacrifice that card. So, like this, Tinker. Time Vault. And it's over. All right. Really like that play of slow rolling the Force of Will to blow out and then just, you know, go for it again. Mm, I like a couple of negations because one of Brian's way to win this matchup is trying to flip the script and, you know, jam a little bit of show and tell, jam a little bit of oath. Um, we'll say on the draw, maybe... A card like Bobble and Trinisphere aren't the greatest. And then we try and, you know, play a similar game to what we just did. There's also simply the case that Brian doesn't like those show and tells at all because of the way they can backfire. And then the plan becomes more, you know, counterspells and Oko, in which case these artifacts are actually reasonable. I think I'll think about that more when I'm when I'm on the play. For now, I think I like this. Pretty <laughs> pretty cool matchup with you know Atraxa getting copied, 
Jewel getting put into play turn one off of the opponent's show and tell. Crazy times. Crazy times indeed. So I guess Brian will have something like maybe a mind break trap, maybe a couple of vigors, maybe a single. Hmm. Yeah, good question. I'm trying to think about what else could be viable. A small adjustments, maybe like an abrupt decay or something. If that's a card I have to think about if I'm trying to set up infinite turns into mana and seemingly, you know, shields down situation. All right, let's see what Brian has cooking for game two. Up a game here, playing Coveted Jewel against the Oath of Druids. Oath of Druids running through the gauntlet here. And I can't wait to pick Brian's brain about the matches at hand and, of course, you know, his love for Oath and how he sees it in the metagame. He's kind of the Oath expert at, at this point. So it's always pretty cool to... Like, Magic is full of these biases, you know? For different reasons. Um, so, but, but Brian is someone I respect a lot, so I, I'm really excited to, to hear what he has to say. All right, a lot of mana and a paradoxical outcome turn one. Or maybe not, actually. No, this is not turn one outcome. Uh, yeah, I mean, th this hand is fine. There is something to be said about this exposing this time vault can both be good and bad. That means it's I can't win on the spot. But well, I guess I guess I still can do that. Black Lotus as well. Okay, so this has Hardcast Force Will written all over it, which is a hand you'll keep. Those three cards in a Force Will. Hmm. So let's think here. So I can go Workshop Monolith. Mana Vault. That's a lot of mana. I think I like that. So, Grim Monolith. This is not the best against Force of Vigor. But I feel like Force of Vigor is going to be a good card against me at most stages of the game. So I try not to worry about it too much. Also here, if my opponent cracks... A Lotus for it. I'm, pr I'm probably going to be fine. I'm always scared when Brian does this. It's been Flash once, and it's been thinning the deck another time. One is uh, substantially more dangerous than the other. Sometimes, if you don't play Bayou, you can get into situations where it's kind of awkward to choose either green or black because both are kind of um, shallow splashes. But let's see what this is. Also, Brian now knows that I might not have, you know, coveted jewel because most of the time I just jam it here. That could be something for the show and tell speculants out of there, uh, out there. Um, if Brian goes for show and tell, unclear what I do. I could put Telerian Academy so I can PO for two, but that's not too impressive, to be honest. So what can I do next turn? I can play Time Vault, then I can play Time Walk and uh, see if I can spike some protection. Let's see. Let's see what this fetch is going to do. I just take it Brian is not playing with any surveillance with the way he fetched in one of the previous games. All right, here's black mana. What is that? Oh, okay. So we are vamping. So that's a good that's a good one. Just double check your deck while you're fetching anyway. So now actually, now I remember this could be a null rod situation. Let's see if there's a null rod in the deck. Okay, so I guess force of will is something I have Brian on still. But I guess there's only one way to find out. So 
Let's see what we can draw. Correction metamorph doesn't do anything right now. Could in the future. Let's go time vault. Then let's go time walk. Then do I take the turn or do I paradoxical outcome? I feel like since these are one shot mana, going for it now doesn't make much sense. I'm really hoping to draw a threat or a counter. And then I, that's, it's kind of the strategy that, that Brian used for match number one, like back to back threat, right? Sink into Stupor is a card that works against Hardcast Force. Mm, so I guess that'll have to do. Let's see. If I add three mana. Also, I don't want to turn on Flusterstorm if I can help it. Flusterstorm is this not reliable counterspell that's sometimes awesome against Jewel. So now I can make three mana and try and draw three. And if I. Yeah, I think I should try and draw th three. Uh, I think tapping like this is reasonable. Let's see. Paradoxical outcome. That's down to five mana. I feel like I should play my land here to not run into any shenanigans. This could hurt me down the line, though. I think it's all right. So let's go. I'm basically targeting Hardcast Force here. Which, which would be a reasonable play. The draw three resolves. Wonder if Brian is scared of, you know, better things happening. I'm also wondering if I'm playing into Mind Break Trap now, and that is... No, that would have been hard cast, I feel like. Hmm. Interesting. Here's Mana Vault. Um, so now let's play out Time Vault once more. The question is, can I play Outcome with... Oh, consigned to memory. So Brian's interaction was... Huh. Brian's interaction was that card, which makes a lot of sense. That's like the opposite of Flusterstorm. It works against the rest of the deck. So getting replicated a million times here is fine. Um, only other question is if I PO in response, but I don't think so. Okay, so now, as I talked about earlier, the game can become a bit more complicated to actually put away. So, because I, I have a harder time winning on the spot. Let's see. So let's play Metamorph, copy. Could copy Lotus. That wouldn't be insane. I guess it's insane in the sense that I can't float the mana, so kind of defeats the purpose. Um, so let me copy Grim Monolith. Then I go for another outcome. Hanging on to Metamorph here. Is that... Yeah, I think that's just... I, sh I shouldn't do that. I should actually play Metamorph. I feel like this is Brian saying the coast is clear. But let's see. This would be a tough one to be wrong about, I will say. One, two, three... Four. Paradoxical outcome drawing four cards, which works. And now I have a tinker. Hmm. Tinker, jewel, draw my deck, I guess. Pretty standard stuff. And then, so let's see. I guess I've sacrificed the. Vault. Coveted Jewel. Draw. And then my end game becomes something with a time walk and an Ursus and or Ursa Saga passing the turn with a ton of counters. Um so let's see, how do I do this the best? Uh I guess Playing out another jewel is decent, so let's go Grimonolith, let's go Coveted Jewel, more Monolith, uh, ooh, ooh, 
So let's go like this. Metamorph. Draw. Metamorph. Draw. More draw. <laughs> Funnily enough, there's another one. So let's just go... Coveted Jewel, draw three. Here's Ancestral Recall. Can't really use that card right now. Um, what else am I working with here? Covet, uh, Grim Monolith. Another Jewel. I have a bunch of jewels in play right now. Here's Karn, which is the card I, I... Well, one of the cards I was looking for. So, let's play Karn. And now... I can just go for, like, a Worm Coil or whatever in the sideboard. And yeah, that's over. So... Sure, I couldn't, you know, take infinite turns, but I could still, you know, draw my deck, build infinite forces, Karn for a Worm Coil, counter whatever, and I'll be just fine. So, pretty pretty cool from my side of the table. Looks like I was just lucky. My action was PO. Brian's interaction was consign. Imagine that's Jewel, then I can get stomped, then we actually have a game. Um, so, yeah, thin margins and uh, the disruption lining up poorly against the threats. That will get you killed in Vintage. All right, that means we have one match remaining. Don't go anywhere. Okay, fourth deck on the calendar here is Mono White Initiative. An aggressive deck that also tries to disrupt its opponent with, you know, the Thalias of the world, the Peacekeepers of the world, while applying pressure with the Initiative creatures. Um, Archon is also another very, very efficient uh, disruptive tool. This deck was a four bobble deck up until recently, but now anymore. So now we get to play stuff like Misstep and main deck Plows. Um, Plows are not going to shine in particular here. I think if Atraxa hits the battlefield, the damage is done a lot of the time. However, uh, Caracas is kind of cool to get rid of uh, Atraxa and hit in for lethal. Also, this upgrade in the land section uh, is huge. Four mana disenchant is going to be immensely powerful against Oath of Druids, not just die. Um, this deck puts on a lot of pressure. It is not a Force of Will deck, which can be a problem. Um, so play draw is going to be huge out of the sideboard for Priests. And uh, we kind of hope for the best. Um, yeah, this deck is very, very fast. If you like aggressive decks, you need to do a little, need to do a little bit of research because of stuff like sequencing, stuff like Anointed Peacekeeper. Um, but yeah, this deck is pretty cool. One copy of the One Ring thrown in for good measure for the longer games. And yeah, it synergizes um, in, in the way that it disrupts Oath of Druids a turn which can be crucial so yeah who knows if that comes up that would be pretty ideal for me um yeah i i'm definitely an underdog in this matchup but i feel like i feel like that's acceptable and uh yeah i'm ready for the challenge all right match four we're at the end of the road i'm playing initiative on the draw against oath and i have a decent hand here can't really complain about that there is something about not um any reasonable fodder for the chromox right now the One Ring not being a white card actually doesn't look that great here. Bosch is on a mulligan. So definitely like that. One of the... I mean, land Mox Oath. I kill it off with a Witch Enchanter. Is that too much to ask? And then I follow up with the One Ring and pull ahead. Come on now. That is, that's reasonable. We all know that. Um, on the more realistic side of things, could be facing a tough decision against land pass when it comes to the Chrome Mox. Um, but if I draw something like, I don't know, a Plow, Archon, any redundant initiated creature, that definitely makes my decision easier. Also worth noting that both of my creatures are humans, in case I am lucky to find a cavern. This is turn one Oath. Here's Orchard. Is this Time Walk? No way. That's so good. The dream. Okay, okay. Okay, I see. I see, Bosh. I see where we're going. Wow, that's so good. Incredible. Incredible draw. Yeah. Maybe, 
I'll, I'll, I'll ask uh, Bosch about, I think, if that's how he, he won all those tournaments with Oath, because that's what dreams are made of. Uh, what are we looking at here? Yeah, there's a, there's a Forcer Will here. We can, we can pack it in. Pretty, pretty smooth sailing. <laughs> so strong. All right, so I can upgrade with Containment Priest. I like that card. These plows are very bad, so is the Solitude. Question is if having a white card in this spot is better than boarding into something like a Null Rod. I'm actually not even sure. Um, I'm going to keep the Solitude and hope to imprint it on a Chrome Box or never draw it. Oof, that was uh, Lotus Orchard. Both Time Walk. Beautiful. That's been a good play for many, many years. I remember when we were oathing into um, a Chroma. Then you had, you know, you needed these six power flyers, so you played Spirit of the Night, and then at some point we needed a third because of, you know, people started to play some tap creatures out of, you know, blue eyed fish, and then we needed like Rorix Blade Wing six five flying haste on top of that. Terrible times. Then I believe we upgraded to some. Overlord, Dragon Overlord kind of card, Big Junt Dragon, which was an 8-8, eight eight, so we had to play that in a Chroma. And then there's been some hybrids with, you know, Blightsteel Colossus, trying to give it haste with Milling Over, Reckless Charge, or um, Dragon Breath, I believe is the name of the card. A little bit of Ember Cool action in there for good measure. So definitely an evolution there. That's kind of the cool thing about a card like Oath is, it just gets better with time. The better creatures that are printed, the better the card is. Kind of the reason why, you know, a card like Birthing Pod got banned in Modern. Greens on Zenith is not legal. It's not because they're necessarily too strong right now, but it just limits what kind of creatures you can print in the future, so it's like an accident waiting to happen. Um, so I think definitely a card like Oath is something that has opened my eyes to that for sure. Um, Kaibuti even oath into like Morphling and Battlefield Scrounger or whatever the name was, the Judgment card from back in the day. Let's see what we can do here. Hmm. Turn one Thalia. Then I have this terrible Solitude, and I'm hoping to draw a land. Let's keep this hand. I mean, the, the Thalia is bad, the Solitude is bad, but if I draw a land, I mean, then I have a good hand, so. And I believe the Thalia can buy time against a lot of hands. You know, making Oath into a 3-drop is not nothing. I even have the Wasteland. Making Show and Tell cost 4. Also, funnily enough, I have exactly the white Mox to make this a Keeper. Thalia resolves, so hopefully it cripples Brian. Black Lotus is definitely something I want to see. So, my Thalia did not get forced. Does that mean that this Dungeoneer is resolving? Should I play Peacekeeper? Yeah, I feel like if I wasteland my opponent here, I also make sure that Brian did not magically just draw a force. I messed this turn up. Because I should have realized this during my attack step and wasted before I went to my second main. Yeah, this is not good. So I can get forced here. Yeah, that's so bad. Okay, well, so at least we got the learnings out there. I should have realized. I'm sad about that one. Brian cannot capitalize. So long goodbye is a three drop and I wasteland my opponent here. So... I guess I just name Oath of Druids, right? Naming Oath. Wastelanding. Don't like that sequence, but... Did not get punished this time. Here's Orchard. Here's Sapphire, attack for five. My opponent needs to rattle some lands here to stay in this game. Now, is it too late? I don't know. 
Priest is a good one. Priest is for sure a good one. I don't think my opponent can play anything here. So now I attack my opponent down to one. And it's over. Play. It's very nice to be on the play in Vintage. That is the... The main thing you should take with you today. <laughs> I mean, now even... Like, Trinity Sphere doesn't do anything. Chalice doesn't do anything. Vexing Bubble doesn't do anything. I feel like I should just cut those for Solitude, even though Solitude is not anything special either. You can even argue a card like Thalia is not that great on the draw, but I don't think I have the luxury to cut that card. Now the game is a lot more about, you know, the Priest, uh, the Witch Enchanter, stuff like that. These cards are not impactful. All right, last game of this video, and then Bosch and I will... will discuss the, the games we played and uh, vintage as a whole so definitely stick around for that one i mean i see two mana sources and two containment priests so we have to keep and hope for the best the way we want we want this hand to play out is um sticking a priest and then getting you know time to you know play in a white plume adventure hope to dodge oko Priest is covering um, Show and Tell and Oath. And I would guess Brian is on a couple of these members. Um, I can't remember if I mentioned, but we only we don't play with open lists. We play with open, you know, archetypes or whatever the case may be. So Brian knew what he was playing against, like in all four matches, and I knew what was up against Oath. That was kind of the, the premise of the video. And then but but Brian doesn't know if I'm playing, you know, Lauren or Chancellors, that's actually a big one. So, Brian, maybe there's some hand that can't afford to fall to Chancellor, like Mox Mox type of situation, or something like Lotus Ancestral, where if you know your opponent's not playing Chancellor, you keep it for sure, and then you actually have to think hard about it um, if, if you have that info. Also worth noting is Consigned to Memory is actually a card that I could see Brian um, having here on the play. <laughs> oh shoot okay so let's see here show and tell this is going to be an Atraxa um, so I feel like I should put in white plume and then get the initiative oh crap it's that card and now I can look deeper for um so the Solitude, I guess. So here I get a land. So now I go Lost Well. I guess even Witch Enchanter kills Sphinx. Sphinx is not that insane. Huh. So now I have Lotus Witch Enchanter. But I think I should get rid of this one, because when I crack my Lotus... I'm not going to have um, close to four mana for a long time. So I guess now I bait uh, the consign with Mox. That did not change anything. So I guess I play Witch Enchanter and I try and kill my opponent's artifact. Okay, well, I can't blame Brian for keeping Show and Tell Sphinx hand. I think that's just, you know, respectable. Now I would imagine Brian has a tough time winning because of my double containment priest shutting down his plan B. I will now stash. Make a treasure. Attack for five. Let's see. Am I playing Archon here? Archon could actually be something that stops 
some ancestral shenanigans to get Brian back into the game. So let's go with Archon. Untap the Witch Enchanter. This is kind of slowing Brian down. I, I, I just guess, I just think the game is over here, but... Guess let's see. Attack for seven. Opponent's now at five life. Under an Archon, I have Priest available. I guess we untap the 3-3 three, three this time. Yeah, that's just game. Not much to report here. Brian had to went had to go for it. Um if I have a way to kill the Sphinx, Brian is in trouble. There's a little bit of metagaming going on with how many plows do I have in the deck? Probably zero. How many solitudes? Probably zero from the point of view of Ryan. I actually had uh, quite a few more of that. Um if this is a Traxa, I lose easily, but this is the one of Sphinx, and I win the game off of the scryed Lotus from gaining the initiative, turn zero. That means I could already scry on my own first upkeep, which is just unheard of. Um, and yeah, getting the job done. So uh, yeah, that's going to do it for the matches. Next up is the wrap-up featuring Bosch and Roll. All right. Welcome back, everyone. This is the debriefing after a cool set of vintage matches played against Bosch and Roll. I'm Andreas. And uh, yeah, here we are to talk a little bit about vintage in general, Brian's love for Oath, and uh, the matches in Eternal Weekend coming up, I guess. So uh, yeah, first of all, good games, Mr. Mr. Oath. Uh, I assume you are used to running a bit hotter with the deck with all the trophies you're racking up uh, in, in real life. Uh, yeah, so that is something I mentioned in my video a little bit like the like you're obviously a world-class vintage player uh, i like to think that uh like you and i are among the scarier people you could queue into at eternal weekend if you're just like a person who showed up for the weekend uh, reasonable and, and yeah it really shows the especially in our dredge match uh, not to get too specific right away but that right that last turn where you knew you had me checkmated through Baseju and ravenous trap if you just don't fuck it up that like i feel like a lot of players on the earth would have lost that game but you could yeah. never lose it just because you know how things move and like how the stack works and priority and and what the last nine cards of your deck were and i knew them too i knew i was dead i knew you knew i was dead and like just there is a lot to be gained just knowing how the decks work right uh, like if if you were a person who just Oh, Eternal Weekend's coming up. Uh, I can borrow bazaars from a friend. I'll just play Dredge. You would have lost that game. And yeah. So it matters a lot who you're playing against uh, is a big part of it. Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's reasonable. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, I like, I like that take a lot. Uh, the average opposition and, of course, you know, running hot or getting allowed to run hot, so to speak. So, yeah, I, I like that a lot. Uh, yeah, you've been crushing with Oath. I, I feel like, did you win a Lotus this year or do I misremember? Uh, yeah, so I, I lost a uh, win and in in Prague playing Oath. I top aided the US with Oath, and then I won the NYSE Black Lotus tournament with Oath over the past 12 months. So it, it yeah, that it's is just, yeah, that's incredible. So what makes you so, obviously, I guess a track says a big part of it, getting the upgrade. That's something I talked a lot about uh, on my end, the upgraded creatures from, you know, a Chroma Angel of Wrath back in my day. And then just Oath getting better and better with better and better creatures. Like, what aside from, you know, the obvious upgrading creature suite it makes you so happy about that deck? So I, I loved Oath historically. Uh, the the four Grizzle Brand builds I was into, and then Brian Kelly won Eternal Weekend the year with uh, Dramoka and Oriok Salvagers as the Oath hits. That deck was awesome. And then Oath just got bad for a long time. But Atraxa... And then the show and tell flash package attracts the pitches to all your forces. Attracts is good enough to flash in one time and get a boost of cards that will help you win the game. Attracts really changed it. And it's the the classic oath problem is, oh no, I drew a monster. That's just a bad card now. But Attracts Oath is the smoothest iteration of oath I think there's ever been in terms of how you can use the monsters even when oath isn't triggering right now. And that's yeah. just really good. Yeah, for sure. That's uh, that's a big part of it. And uh, I, I just always appreciate the deck specialists, and I would consider you like the Oath specialist, always sticking to that deck. And also, as I mentioned, we didn't know about each other's lists specifically today, but we knew about 
like the archetype or the deck or whatever. How much did that play into your side of it? Like how much of a guessing game were you on today? I just built the deck how I would if it was Eternal Weekend. And yeah. that's with the information I have. Like I was very clear in my side of the matches that I have not played a lot of vintage since Modern Horizons 3 came out. And uh, this is the start of my testing for Eternal Weekend. Uh, I'm... I have Magic on Vegas next week, and I have Legacy Tournaments there. I have another Modern Pioneer Split Invitational before I even start thinking about Eternal Weekend. Right. And I usually just cram Vintage in the week or two before the event. So this was yeah. my first time playing with Into the Flood Maw. It was my first time playing Vintage with Consigned to Memory. It was the first time I shoved a Sphinx of the Steelwind into Witch Enchanter uh, and quickly learned a lesson there. So uh, yeah, there was just there was some learning stuff. My deck would probably be a little different. I'd change a few cards right away. And yeah. with a couple more weeks of thinking about it, it would probably look even more different. And I'm still yeah. not locked on Oath for Eternal Weekend. Uh, I, I've had a really good year with the deck. But for the purposes of this challenge, when we were talking about making this video, uh, I just said my people would riot if I didn't play Oath. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I'm not necessarily playing Oath at Eternal Weekend. I just wanted to oh, okay. get a feel for it right now in the yeah, gauntlet. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, see if it's still uh, all all the rage. So let's get to the let's get to the matches here. So first up, we had the Demir Luris deck, which is the I would call the deck to beat in Vintage right now, mm -hmm. and also one of the big biggest reasons to play Oath because that deck pl plays only counter spells to defend basically. Um, so if you're expecting to play against that at the top tables, seems like a good choice. And those games were. Not too interesting, if I remember correctly. I think you went back-to-back -back threat in the one game, and then what happened the next game? Uh, do you remember game two? I think I just protected a Tinker, and then you conceded. Or, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, or it was something like that, or I yeah, show and tell, and you saw that the show and tell could get Tinker. Like, it was something very quick. It was two very yeah. uneventful games. Yeah, for, for sure. So obviously I fought less than I would on average, but I think in general, my deck struggles with Oath because even if you play that card out proactively, I'm in big trouble. Then yeah. my way to win the game is some obscure build, a lot of creatures and cast a time walk, or actually use consign in the sideboarded games as a kind of a time walk. Mm -hmm. That's also a, a way to win the game. But the problem is Oko is so strong against my deck just pound for pound where... That is not the case against, you know, all matchups, but against Lurus, it's just, it's just so good. So it just lines up well, I feel like. Yeah, that's what I was saying, and that's what I was saying a year ago, too, when I picked Oath for Eternal Weekend last year. Uh, Demir Lurus was the the top deck to beat then, too. Some things never changed despite multiple restrictions, and really the only thing the restrictions of Urza Saga and Vexing Bobble did for the oath Lurus matchup is make it better for Oath, because now... Oh, for sure. Now, instead of Time Vault being the out, which can be, like, now you have to win with creatures. You have to put a creature into play and attack me eventually. Yep. Even if you get complete control of the game and set up four consigned memories and a Time Walk in a row to just push through an Oath, that's kind of the thing you have to do now, where, yep. uh, like, Psychic Frog, Bowmasters are a lot worse against the card Oath of Druids than Time Vault is. Yeah, I will. I will just mention that Bowmasters plus and and step and then Time Twister is also a way mm -hmm. to actually get there around the the Oath trigger. But yeah, definitely very tough matchup. And yeah, not the most eventful one. Um, what did what did we have up next for our second one? I think we did Dredge next. Yeah, that was Dredge. So you highlighted already one of the games. Um, I remember I mulliganed a lot in the first game, and I had one force. You you went either backup or back to back threat, kind of the same formula. That's very that was awesome against Luris. I didn't have much to do there. Then game two, I have double force, which is amazing. I talked about this when Dredge has you know seven cards, double disruption. That's where you want to be against almost any deck, and you really got to uh, feel the the pain of that. Did I tip it off when I griefed you? By the way, that I wanted you to tinker at some point, or was that just all in my mind? Uh, no. I don't remember the exact situation, but I remember being griefed and saying, oh, he's probably going to take uh, this, but then you took something else instead. And that yeah, just... I, took, I took show and tell and left you with the MSA. Yeah, yeah, yep. So that made sense. And especially that game went really long because I had the tabernacle that made yeah. you go onto the Icarid plan. And I stuck the tabernacle at more than 12 life. I think it was still, it might have still been at 20 when I played the tabernacle. And I was yeah, like, I think so. yeah. I'm out of reach of creeping chill now. So this yeah. should be, like, buy me a lot of time, but Creeping Chill wasn't in your deck. 
at that point. Yeah, at, yeah correct. Which we found out as we played out your entire deck that game. And then yep. yeah, just all four Icarids. Uh, that game, it came down to, I just didn't have a green source for my Baseju. Like that was a game where I used Baseju to cast Oko just to stay alive a little longer. But yeah, if, I remember that. If I had clipped your Bazaar when you only had one or two Icarids in the graveyard, it wasn't enough damage. I would have played Oko next turn. You would have run out of black creatures and then I have all uh -huh. the time. So that one yep. was just like Dredge doing its thing, narrowly squeezing through uh, yeah. when it couldn't do everything it wanted to do. And then I adjusted for game three because now I had the Leyline confirmed. And I, oh, sorry, not Leyline, exactly the opposite. I didn't have Leyline to worry about. I think, at least I think so. So I wanted the chills uh, because I think I shaved, I shaved like one grief and trying to think about what else I shaved for that game, the Wastelands, because on the draw, kind of awkward. And now the Creeping Chills were actually useful because mm -hmm. I saw the Tabernacle and I, I, I feel like I'd, I could easily lose a close game to that card. Um, so I adjusted a little bit. And then as the game went by, I think I'm in this game, I, I, I hit four Narc Amoebas, but my Icarus are incredibly deep in the deck, which inevitably ends up giving you a lot of time. And then you can talk a little bit about your Atraxa trigger and what you got from it uh, and kind of the squeeze you alluded to earlier. Yeah, that game, uh, you kept seven, you had double force, you had Bazaar, yes. you were doing everything that you're supposed to do as a dredge deck. And it's still, the game came down to a spot where I was one mana short of getting complete control, I think two or three turns in a row, where it was like yeah. the Atraxa trigger... I was one mana short of time walk plus besage you or something, or uh, yep. I was one mana short of tinkering. So I had to demonic tutor for tabernacle just to stay alive for a turn instead. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately the attracts also revealed the ravenous trap. So you knew to play around it and your graveyard was big enough that if I don't do anything, I die to your slow dredge. If I do yep. anything, you bizarre in response. And then yep. uh, that one, the on the final turn where I had to hard cast my Ravenous Trap in your upkeep, if I had one more mana there, I could have forced I could have besaged on my turn, forcing the activation, yep. then Ravenous Trap just ends the game. Yep. And I was just one mana short for those that whole sequence. And you just like miracle missed on those two creeping chills uh when I did hard cast the trap. Yeah, and I think I had 23 cards and I had to hit uh, two of. So yeah. it's not, I would, I mean, I don't know the math, but I don't, I don't think it's that unreasonable to miss there. Yeah, it, it was, it's probably close to a coin flip. Uh, might yeah, be a little I would, better. I, I would guess so. I, I was prepared to die when I cast that spell, basically, and I was happy when I didn't. And then it was a spot where you have 12 cards in your deck, you have one bazaar left. Yeah. Uh, if the creeping <laughs> chills are above the bazaar, you can't win. If Correct. the, if I find anything before you find the bazaar, I win. And yes. then the bazaar was like your second draw. Uh, oh, yeah. And I drew That's the, uh, what dreams are made of. Right. I drew the Forbidden Orchard the turn you drew the bazaar, which if it was yeah. the other way, I would have had a Traxa going. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it just, that was like the tightest margin you, you can imagine. Yeah, that was a really great game. Uh, but it did showcase why I don't like playing a million ley lines in my oath sideboard because you had the the nuts you just kept seven had double force bizarre going everything even hollow one I, th I think that game right yeah you started on hollow one every single thing went your way you drew better than me uh your dredges were pretty good and it still came down to you know a you, you had to find your one of in 12 cards before i found literally anything after yeah. a really cool back and forth so yeah you i don't like Ley lines. I don't like being that heavy. Maybe uh, I did two tabernacle, one ravenous trap was my build. Maybe oh, okay. reconfiguring that maybe a little more. Maybe I don't need two tabernacles. Like dial it in a little more for how yep. dredge is currently constructed. But that everything went your way that game and it was still just so close. And that's yeah, why I that, don't think Oath needs to be that crazy about dredge. That, that, that's a reasonable analysis. I also like this, the Sarah's emissary kind of doing a lot of double duty. It's a big threat with show and tell. Mm -hmm. Um, also that game, when you have six mana and you're one off from casting a track, so I have force of vigor green card, but I don't go for it. And that's like the most, at that point, oath is too late, but I could actually delay your hard cast attracts and make mm -hmm. orchard and pearl bad draws. So that's like a slight, you know, if I'm a, a completely on top of my game, I vigor your mox jet or whatever it was and 
simply doesn't don't allow for this. But that's always that's high level stuff, and uh, there's always room, room room for growth. Yeah, um, that that's something that's worth pointing out to the viewers as well. And I said it in my deck tech at the start of the video that uh, when Oath is going wrong, like this Oath build is so good at presenting a threat, presenting a threat, presenting a threat, and if they fend it off, they've probably had to force twice to do that. Then nobody has anything, and. Yeah those games lend themselves to seven mana Atraxa eventually. Uh, you cast yep. Atraxa a lot when you play this deck, and yeah. that's always one of the clocks that's ticking. Oh, for sure. And uh, yeah, big big, big, big thing to highlight about the deck for sure. Up next, we had Coveted Jewel, and that is, oh my goodness, that was a lot of action on turn one. You decide to go for your show and tell, and then I just simply just have my my, my hand lined up perfectly because I could even respond with a PO before yep. you getting access to the next cards. Yeah, that one, I kind of knew I was playing with fire. Uh, I kept a six that had force, blue card, show and tell, Atraxa, demonic tutor, mox jet. So I needed to draw any mana source before my hand yeah. does anything, but I play, you know, 26 mana sources or whatever like close to half sure. the deck is a a draw then i get to dt and do whatever i want and i get to pass the force check the first time and i could have just dt'd for a second force and have force force blue card blue card and try to grind into the goop with you i could have gotten tinker uh and maybe that's better uh it's uh but i wouldn't have had the mana source so i just got black lotus and decided to shove and if you have the one ring, that's fine. If you have jewel, that's annoying. But I, there's not many I, instants in your deck. Uh, but correct. You had the one I, that mattered. I think with the way this played out, jewel. Uh, I mean, the one ring was for sure not the card I had because I I had four mana available and right, didn't do yeah. anything. So at this point, when I'm metamorphing a mox, I'm kind of bridging to the jewel. That's yeah, kind of what I, I'm I saying, said right? when we were playing. He he has a turn two jewel, and then yeah, I think. I like to think I'd be more dialed in at Eternal Weekend, but I I result I drew the land, I resolved the demonic tutor, and then I was looking at my whole deck just thinking about my options, and then I was like, oh, Black Lotus, bang, and just did it. Yeah. Uh, so I and maybe you could have been tighter. Fine. You're maybe maybe it's the th also the fact that I get my three cards first, so there's something about you know sink into stupor being relevant all of a sudden. There's just a little bit of. Uh, but I, I I don't think waiting will do you much much good there. Then you have to you know fight over the jewel anyway and maybe get into a, like you basically give you more time to make the show until good on my end. Yeah, um, the, yeah. The real problem was I couldn't do anything. I didn't have further plan. Like if I demonic tutor for a second force there, I force pitching show and tell. Then I force pitching Atraxa, and then my hand is yeah. like show and tell, and I have two mana sources in play and nothing else going on, which. Maybe and just I don't think, putting you in the garbage is what I need to do and try to high roll. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's a tough one usually. And also, I don't even think you had green mana in your mana base, so you have, you're even further away from casting yeah. a game ending spell. So I can definitely see why you went for it. Um, and then game two, it's just like my I talked a lot about the disruption lining up either great or poorly when it comes to you know fluster storms hit or miss consign is well if I have paradoxical outcome. Also a miss, right? So that was just like a matter of you can't mulligan something that handles the one ring in jewel. Yep. That's just unreasonable. But I had PO, so I guess I'm just the greatest, right? That yeah. was more of a thing of, you know, how things lined up, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I said that on my side in the video as well, where uh, your deck has like car and jewel one ring uh, that consign handles, and then it has the four POs that it doesn't. And... Yeah, ancestral tinker. Yeah, more or it, less those it's like two thirds. Yeah, and I did leave in Flusterstorm this time. Uh, I wasn't doing that six months ago. I was just cutting Flusterstorm versus Jewel because I yeah. didn't like anywhere it went. But now with Sink into Stupor, there's more things worth flustering. But yeah, I, I I had the Vampiric Tutor that game where it was like I could get Null Rod, but my hand is Land Mox Lotus, so I'm yeah. I'm putting myself down to one land to play the game with. Or I could get, again, the show and tell and uh, just it lose to whatever you put in. Or I could get yep. Tinker. And then if you have Force, I have nothing. I'm also playing on one land. And yep. uh, I just ended up getting Ancestral Recall to try to you know, find some combination of land and spell. 
and yeah. it ended up just my ancestor was a blank and then i just had to hide behind consigned to memory for the whole game yeah and i, and I could change some po's and, and draw my deck so not much to say there except jewel asks a lot of tough questions and if you have a pyroblast you can lose to jewel if you have a consign you can lose to po or tinker or whatever that's part of what makes the deck great um so yeah Jewel is in the books, then in the end we had Mono White, and then you started to show uh, the potential of Oath with the uh, Lotus Time Walk ter uh, turn one. That was beautiful. Yeah, I just had the nuts on the play, knowing the matchup and everything. Uh, that oh, yeah. one was, was very easy. I'm glad I got to showcase why you might select Oath for a tournament. Like Mono White's been a top five deck at Vintage for a year and a half, two years now, and yeah. it was even flirting with the top deck around Eternal Weekend last year. And yep. that matchup structurally is just laughably positive for Oath. Obviously, things can... You could, like, mold a five and have to go all in on a creature that dies easily. Like, that could happen. But generally, just the structure of one deck versus the other. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. I do think having the four Witch Enchanters makes it, you know... There's more game to it now, where earlier that was like some 7-drop angel card, card that was never going to be relevant except for a mana source. Um, but I actually think the Witch Enchanter is, you know, sometimes, you know, kill an oath, sometimes even uncounterable. And uh, that, that, that does give a bit more game. Um, but in general, I agree, you don't even care that much about Archon. Sometimes you do, but I have a lot of the initiative creatures you can you can kind of handle. So, so yeah, I, I agree. That's a good reason to... Uh, to pilot oath um if, if initiative is popular yep yeah and uh, like we talked about in white initiative is a creature deck uh that needs to put a creature into play to win luris uh, is a creature deck needs to put a creature yeah. into play to win and then if we leave the the top five decks in dredge is a little different and jewel shops obviously something completely different than everything else uh if we leave the top five decks you run into like bug there's death rate luris decks like four color luris there's yep. uh, aggro shops and prison shops i like oath against all of that yeah it just all, the whole i mean doomsday is somewhere in the top 10 as well i don't like that matchup uh doomsday and jewel shops are the ones i'm most worried about but the rest of these decks win with creatures and especially at eternal weekend like an open field is 600 players or whatever is people might not own power. Uh, there is a un unpowered and budget prizes at Eternal Weekend. Yeah. Like if I queue into Legacy Mono Red Stompy, I just want to crush that deck with something like Oath. I don't want to be yeah. surprised at like, oh, I only budgeted for the top five decks. Like I, I carefully tuned my Demir Luris deck and then you just get Blood Moon and die. Uh, I like being just proactive and powerful versus random crap that you might play against. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's uh, that's a good point about, you know, bigger tournaments and not just, you know, 40 person grinders playing against each other online. That's usually my my uh, my backyard. Right. Um, I wanted to ask about one more thing, but now it's slipping my mind before I let you go. So Pittsburgh is still your hometown, right? It's going to be a hometown uh, eternal weekend. Yep. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's great. Uh, shout out to Card Titan for holding it in Pittsburgh year after year. That rules for me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I think I don't I don't I don't have much more. I like the way we got to showcase the format. Very different decks when you think about it, and so much intricacies in each matchup. Um, something I noted uh, mentioned on my side was the whole knowing the matchup, how powerful that is. Because mm -hmm. I'm used to playing a lot in the dark or leaning on you know googling my opponent, and then who knows what comes up. Um, but yeah, I mean, if your opponent's on Dredge or Jewel, that is, you need totally different cards to uh, you know. To, to handle that and, and playing a deck like oath i imagine you basically just you mainly play your own plan you're very proactive so you don't have to worry about that as much as a classic control deck yeah definitely just having nine win the game spells in your deck and you can sculpt around how am i going to shove one of these into play uh, that gives you a lot of it raises the floor in random matchups random unknown matchups and uh I, one thing that is always like a joy and then super stressful is like at eternal weekend or a big seven round eight round and beyond tournament if you're undefeated the field gets smaller and yeah. you can eventually memorize all the undefeated decks and then you have that information but then when you take your first loss you go from a pool of six or eight people to a pool of 24 yeah. people 
and oh, yeah. then you don't know anything anymore. So it's actually like a huge competitive loss in addition to losing a match and having to win out from there. Like that yeah. is, and that's something that uh, people I, I coach and, and work with are surprised by when I say like, uh, oh yeah, or in a tournament report where I'm like, yeah, I knew what my opponent was playing. People are like, how? It's like, because I look around because yeah. that's important to know. Oh, for sure. I, I used to do that a lot as well. And uh, back in my heyday, uh, we had like a group chat and helped each other scout and stuff like that. It, it's 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 a big part of it. The information is big because that's why to get action probe is a great card. It's better to know what your opponent has than to guess about it, right? That's just that's just how it goes. Yeah, I'd start every well, match at 18 if I could know my opponent's deck. Oh, uh, definitely. I'll, I'll take that trade as well. Yeah. But yeah, that by the way, last thing you got a match win off me today. I just want to I just want to yeah. mention that not too much about it but just one tiny comment i showed the world that even gods can bleed <laughs> yeah I, I actually thought i was done for when i was down, down a game with dredge then i thought oh yeah this is this is brian's day to shine but uh yeah that game three nope. when you just kept seven i'm sure you were you were pretty happy yeah yeah yeah. then then i knew the tides were turning but uh yeah I, that's gonna do it for us today uh you can uh, get us out of here and uh yeah good games as always it was uh it was a cool day all right. Yeah. Uh, everybody, thanks for watching. If you're watching on my side, this has been Echo Baronin, Andreas Peterson. If you're watching on his side, I'm Boston Roll, Brian Koval. We both have channels. Go check out the other side of the matches. And uh, thanks for watching. <laughs>